I think it's because people never got to see the bird because they're so sneaky. This booming sound, you know, it had to be something to be feared. And so it fitted well with the stories of the bunyip. The bunyip bird today on Off Track. Little known, rarely seen and historically misunderstood. Anne Jones is my name and today we're off to the Riverina in New South Wales. We'll be travelling between Collyamberley and Griffith, hoping to catch a glimpse and even better, a part of the love song of the Australasian bittern. As we drive along the road we see bays of rice, then wheat, cotton, some fruit trees, corn and all sorts of other crops. Farmers have diversified to deal with the environmental and economic conditions, revised water allocations, as well as agronomic advances. There's not much unused space though. Fence lines might have some trees, there might be some long grass between rice bays. So it's really quite fascinating that of all the places to choose, the very rare Australian bittern has turned up out here in the middle of irrigated cropping agriculture. Their sightings are so important that an alliance of groups has set up a project called Bitterns in Rice, primarily funded by the Riverina Local Land Services, with involvement from the Rice Growers Association of Australia and BirdLife Australia. Matt Herring is the wildlife ecologist at the helm of the project. He's uh, spent a lot of time lately looking across bays of rice, searching for the elusive bunyip bird. Because they're such sneaks, they're so cryptic out there, hiding in the swamps, that booming noise that the males make during the breeding season was thought to be the sound of the bunyip. And this was uh, told for many thousands of years by various indigenous language groups. And then colonists got a hold of it a couple of hundred years or so ago. And I think they inflated those tales further and uh, it's a great alternative uh, common name, the, the bunyip bird. The Australasian bittern is a mysterious bird, a very sneaky and certainly a difficult to study animal. They're a large bird, so you'd think that you'd see them more. When their necks are stretched out, they're almost a metre tall and uh, they're mostly mottled brown and cream and uh, they're a similar shape to a heron or an egret but just a bit heavier set. The bitterns are swamp birds so certainly in southeastern Australia you can find them in coastal swamps that have lots of water plants in them like rushes and sedges and reeds and and so on. But a lot of those wetlands, of course, along the coast have, have been lost and, and that's a, a big reason for their decline. So what is their conservation status? In Australia, they're listed as endangered and they're also considered endangered at the global level. In fact, the worldwide population estimate for the bird, which occurs in Australia, New Zealand and New Caledonia, is about 2,500 individuals. Wetland birds have had a rough run. Water frontage is highly sought after and they need to live there, right in the same spots that we like to put marinas and golf courses, farming and industry. And the Australian bittern has some really specific needs too. They like to have cover right up to their chin and have their feet in the water. So with all that in mind, it's unexpected really that such a sensitive bird would turn up in the heart of an altered landscape in the middle of industrialised farming. The Riverina is a highly modified landscape. Before uh, all the irrigation and, and all the farming, the Riverina would have been incredible for wetlands, but probably only, you know, two or three years out of every decade 
and the rest of those years, the seven or eight other years, they, they would have mostly been dry. This is that boom and bust cycle that we have in Australia. It's interesting that in a, in a season like this, there's, there's all this rice and it's providing habitat and yet without irrigation there actually wouldn't be much wetland habitat at this time of year in this year now. It's a very novel situation having rice fields here. They're basically acting as surrogate wetlands. The area's been heavily cropped for longer than living memory. And it's the rice that the bitterns seem to be attracted to, so why is that? The rice crops seem to provide the perfect habitat for, for bitterns. They're, they're ephemeral wetlands, so they're only full for about six months of the year. After harvest, they're dry and they stay dry until sowing, and they've got lots of that cover uh, in the form of rice plants that bitterns love. So for many, many thousands of years, it used to be reeds and rushes and sedges and, and so on. And now it, it's these rice plants also providing cover. But probably the most important thing is that the things that bitterns love to eat are there in the rice crops. Uh, and there's lots of tasty yabbies and enormous numbers of frogs. There's also small fish and other things for them to feed on. Matt Herring and I have just pulled up at a farm near Colliamberley. Ian Payne was born in the area and this farm is one of six holdings he works with his family. So as you can imagine, he's very familiar with the sorts of animals that live in the rice bays on his farm. Well, there's, there's frogs and there's bitterns and there's all sorts of water birds. I mean, yeah, they love it. There's ferals, like foxes and rabbits and hares, but, um, yeah, and, and carp. There's um, definitely yabbies. Quite often see snakes in the rice, particularly browns, but there's, and there's also uh, tiger snakes and red-bellied black snakes too. So I suppose they must be after the frogs, are they? For sure, yeah. yeah. Yep. You can probably see some good hunting scenes when, if, you've, if you're quiet. Yeah, for sure, yep, yeah. Yep. No, there's, there's, and, there, yeah, there's lots of them. <laughs> just be careful when you go over there. I'm just going to go stomp over here then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and have you actually seen a bittern? For sure. Lots of bitterns, yeah, over a long period of time. With the rice, we, we sample the crop at panicle initiation, um, so we know how much nitrogen to top dress the crop with to maximise yields. And uh, my son and, uh, and our employee, Jesse, were uh, doing the sampling, which involves walking through the paddock. And in one particular aerial zone paddock, they, they came back to me and said that they had seen nine bitterns in one paddock. Nine? That's actually a pretty high percentage of the overall estimated world population. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what do they look like? Uh, they're about 30 to 40 centimetres high. you got a a uh, neck that sort of recoils back and a sharp beak and um, a brownie sort of feathers. What do they sound like? Uh, they make a booming sound. What does that mean? <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> there was one then. It was a, it's a low, I don't know, oboe type boom, yeah. It was, it was from that way, was it? Yeah. 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 When did you first realise that there are actually bitterns on your, on your property? I, I reckon they've been here a long time. I mean, because I, I drive the harvester, that's one of my jobs, and um, I've driven it since uh, the early 90s probably. So I reckon I can recall seeing them off the header then, even. So it wasn't a surprise to you when these blokes turned up and started talking about bitterns? I didn't know what the fuss was about. <laughs> Because they've just been been around. <laughs> so what was it like when you actually found out then that they're actually internationally endangered? Well, it's just awesome that they're here. Really awesome, yeah. I just think it's great that we can grow our food, high-quality food, and uh, support an endangered species. I think it's just fantastic. Has this knowledge, the fact that they are an endangered bird, ch changed the, the management of your farm? No, we just do what we do. We love growing rice and they obviously love living in it. 
despite the fact that we could hear a male booming very occasionally off in the distance, Matt really wanted to hit the road to get to Griffith, where he thought we'd have a good chance of seeing some birds at closer range. In the car with us is Neil Bull, the Environmental Programs Manager from the Rice Growers Association of Australia, and he's been involved in farming and conservation for decades. As a general rule, what is the rice growers' attitude to birds in their farm? My experience as both a farmer and working with the industry is the majority of farm, farmers are very keen to see uh, biodiversity on the farm and, and have a strong interest in the bird life they see. Um, I won't deny that there are uh, some bird species that can be a pest to the rice farmer and, yeah, and I will raise it. Ducks will come in to aerial sown crops early in the season and can do significant damage so the general approach is to try and uh, deter or root shift the ducks away from the crops with a number of mechanisms but generally not you know most farmers try to scare them away not to shoot them. Bittens from what we're seeing from the survey, this survey work there's minimal damage if any at all to a rice crop um, and they're not feeding on the crop whereas the ducks are coming in often they're hungry from their own wetlands drying out, out or whatever and they're after the grain or if it, you know some other species like the graze the crop but yeah it's a totally different thing and what we're doing seems to be growing very good rice and rice it's growing to the nice height and our water levels are suitable for the bittens to come in and we seem to have enough food at, in our rice bays to support the bittens for the bittens to breed and raise chicks so I think it's early days yet in terms of learning about the bittens in rice uh, but it's also a very exciting time. Things are always changing, but I, I cannot see rice being uh, taken out of the area we're currently growing. I think we will still have enough water available for it to be around for a long time to come. That sounds like good news for the bittern. Well, I think it's very good news for bitterns and good news for rice growers, but you know, I think it does go hand in hand. Um, you know, I'm hopeful we can do more with habitat away from the rice environment for the Australasian bittern as well. But we're in there now, we've come a long way. There's been so much change with the basin plan implementation and water recovery. Um, it's been very stressful for many people along the way. I'm just hoping from here on in, we can have reasonable seasons, some allocations, and, and we can progress with water out in our rice fields. So is there much that has to be done on the rice farm to make it bitten friendly? Matt Herring. We're slowly learning the ways that rice growing can be tweaked to further benefit the bitterns. One of our key findings so far is that they're more or less absent from about half the rice and that rice has been sown at the beginning of the season by direct drilling. It's often called combine sowing or sod sowing and those types of sowing have delayed permanent water and they have dry uh, phases. So that is a really important thing that we found, that the bitterns have an aversion for those types of sowing methods and they show a strong preference for rice crops that have been sown aerially. It seems to be because the, the water in those crops is there earlier and so the, the prey base, the frogs, the yabbies and so on, get going earlier. So that is one simple thing that a rice farmer can do is choose to sow it aerially and have that earlier permanent water. It is quite a paradox that a, that a lot of the, the shift towards direct drill, combine sowing rice has been to save water. And in saving water, you know, potentially the bitten population has been affected quite, quite significantly. If, if half, roughly half of the rice is now sown in that way, you know, potentially half of the population has gone. Um, so, so these changes, um, agronomic changes, as the industry progresses, are really important um, for, for us to understand how they affect species like the bitterns and obviously work together to, to find win-wins where, where the yield increases can um, unfold alongside advances for bitten conservation. 
On the way to hopefully seeing some bitterns, we drop in to say g'day to Gary Andriazza, who's had bitterns visiting his rice bays all through January. There's always birds hanging around from when you first put the water on it there. Yeah, there's, uh, you can hear all the frogs and everything. Yeah, you can see a lot of frogs coming out. Where do they come from? The, from the ground? I wouldn't have a clue. I know after, after the drought there, there was no, you couldn't hear a frog. And then after we, as soon as we, we flushed the rice with water, I said you could hear all frogs at night. So. And what, is that, what does that make you feel as a farmer when you hear that sort of sound? Oh, very, very good, that the rice is doing a bit of good, that the water's doing a bit of good in the area. What sort of birds do you see around here? Uh, well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of ibises, a lot of, uh, plenty of, always plenty of ducks around, that's for sure. We're here today specifically for one of these birds that's an endangered bird. Did you even know about this bird um, before this bittern project happened? Yeah, we've seen them around, we just didn't know what, 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 what seen a few around, we didn't know what they really were until... Uh, Matt really told us what they were. <laughs> what do bitterns look like, do you reckon? A long head sticking up out of the rice. That's the first uh, indication, I suppose. <laughs> What's this bird? <laughs> yeah, they sort of look like they put up a little periscope um, as they come up. So once you found out that they were actually um, an endangered species, was that a surprise to you? Yeah, well, it was, it was really a surprise. Anyway, it's good to see that they're... Uh, the, the water's doing a bit of good, the rice is doing a bit of good for the area. And on top of that, I understand that we've got a bit of an event happening in one of your bays at the moment. There's actually some nests. Yes, as Matt was saying, yeah, there's some nests there with ho hopefully some chicks in there. <laughs> so did you have any idea that these guys had actually taken up residence in one of your rice bays? Oh, well, you see them around, you think they would have, well, if they're hanging around here all the time, you think they'd have to be doing something around here. <laughs> But it's good to know that they actually are. Has the fact that you've, you know, that they've confirmed sightings of bitterns on your property, has that changed the way that you have been managing your rice? Well, uh, not really. They just seem to fit right in, really. <laughs> yeah, they, they, we're not affecting them and they're not affecting us, really. And it'll be really interesting to see where they go after the rice is finished, you know, come, uh, uh, you know, April, May. It's a real mystery as to where these bitterns go after the rice has been harvested. We've learnt over the last three years that there's a very significant breeding population using the rice, but it's pretty much anyone's guess where they spend the other six months of the year. But fortunately, uh, we're going to be able to find out uh, these secrets, uncover these secrets very soon. Towards the end of last year, we ran a very successful crowdfunding campaign and we raised enough money to satellite track uh, at least 10 bitterns. Matt Herring is yet to put the trackers on the bitterns, but it will be happening very soon and we'll all be able to see where they end up by looking on the internet. Meanwhile, Matt Herring, Neil Bull and I are driving along a bank between rice bays, peering into the rice, trying to see if we can spy any bitterns. What we're looking for is a beak and a head. The bittern will stand with its beak pushed upwards towards the sky, basically pretending to be a reed in the rice. It's excellent camouflage. This is the bee's knees of bittern sights. Why is that? Well, for the first time, we actually found a booming male Australasian bittern that has three females and they each have a nest. These three nests right here next to us are about 50 metres apart and altogether there's nine chicks, so it's very exciting. This is, this is the, the next generation of, of bitterns that use the rice. Look. Yes. You got it. And, it, and it, it would be delivering food to its to its chicks. We've just seen a smaller bittern being a female, and no doubt she's busy delivering little carp and perhaps yabbies and frogs to the gorgeous little chicks out there. I picked it immediately because of the interesting neck shape. <laughs> yeah, the neck is very interesting. It reminds me a little bit of Inspector Gadget. It can be squashed down and look quite stumpy and stout, or it can be a, 
uh, virtually a periscope, you know, an extendable um, piece to, to look out above the rice. Another interesting thing was, as far as I could see, that bird alighted from a grassy strip that's actually between two bays of rice. Yeah, the, the grassy banks uh, seem to be important. There's good cover there, um, not just for the adults, but also the chicks when they're moving around the, the rice bay before they can fly. So what's that one? That looks like, like a, a great crop. cormorant. Look at that wingspan! Yes. Now over the last couple of years as you've been out surveying with your binoculars, I understand there's been a bit of a surprise um, entry into the bird contest. Um, another endangered species. Yes, we were really surprised when Australian painted snipe started turning up. In total, in the 2012-2013 season, we had 87 birds all together. Now, the painted snipe is equally threatened uh, as the Australasian bittern. These are Australia's two most threatened water birds, and here they are uh, using rice fields in their hundreds. The, the catch with the Australian painted snipe is it, it appears that it only uses the rice in significant numbers in some years, whereas the bitterns uh, are here every year. So the bittern seem to like it when there's a fair bit of water in there, so they've got lots of nice frogs and yabbies and things to munch on. Are the snipes the same? Do they have the same requirements of the rice field? No, it's, okay. it's quite a contrast. Uh, painted snipe are a much smaller bird, um, the size of a small plover or a sandpiper, and and they don't swim, so they need m much um, shallower water, and they like the cover. They're another sneak, but it can't be too big, and so potentially these habitat requirements are incompatible. But I'm sure you can manage a rice field that caters for both of them. So you can have some areas that are more open with mud flats and low cover and have the actual rice crop itself for the bitterns. I think we can do both. And what about the rice yields? I mean, is potentially managing, you know, with these conservation values in mind going to affect the overall output of the rice, which is indeed for these landowners the very first priority? Yeah, I think that is the crucial question. Moving forward, we want to find out um, ways to benefit bitterns, painted snipe and biodiversity generally in rice fields um, without hindering production. So some of the um, bitten friendly tips that we have are, are really appealing to growers because they don't have any impact. and. In the past, uh, when we've thought about wildlife conservation on farms, it's almost always been about the bits that are out of production, like the, the creek down the back, we might fence that off. And whereas the situation here with the bitterns and other um, waterbirds in the rice is that they're explicitly using parts of the farm where where the production is, where the agricultural production is, and the potential here is enormous. If, if, if you know, if we can make gains for these species in these parts of the farm, then it's huge because that's what most of the landscape is. It's used for production. What does the survival of this species mean to you? The survival of uh, of the bitten, I feel. Um, personally respond beginning to feel personally responsible because I know uh, no, no one else uh, at least in Australia has been able to look into them in this much detail so I have thought that it, it's my obligation to ensure that uh, in the Riverina 
it's, it's my responsibility to ensure that they continue to maintain a, a population. I, I certainly want my kids and grandkids to be able to hear the boom of the bunyip and to see those strange heads poking out above the uh, rice or, or other wetland vegetation. In the past, I've always looked for species like the bittern in the best natural wetlands left in the landscape and in these recent years I have been pinching myself that I've found that I've found such a such a love for for what is a crop what is just a you know a, a grain crop but these are my best results ever for these threatened water birds and the the populations out here in in the rice fields of the Riverina are they just compel me to continue working on this project. Matt Herring is with the Bitterns in Rice Project, and you also heard from Neil Bull from the Rice Growers Association of Australia, Gary Andriazzo from Griffith, and Ian Payne from Collie It is interesting that Bitterns seem to return once and again to the crops. However, there's still a lot more to find out about their behaviours and also whether the rice is actually serving as an adequate replacement to natural wetland. It's also important to note that while the Australasian bitterns seem to like the rice bays, there are plenty of species that don't, like the pobblebonk frogs or the little bittern. Now, make sure you put the caps back on your binoculars and put them away where you can find them because next week I'll take you somewhere else. <laughs>